Hello again and welcome back to Illegally Sighted. This is Jesse and I am back for another channel update and a random topic video. And I do have a few things <clears throat> that I do want to uh, talk about this month. I thought about recording this uh, within the last week or so off and on. But <clears throat> especially after late last week, wanted to wait until at the very least Microsoft's business event uh, happened earlier today as I'm recording this. And um, since then, I have not really gone on to social media or YouTube or podcast to hear what everyone else thinks, because I just want to give my honest thoughts on that whole topic and hubbub that has been going on the last mm, few weeks. Before we do that, though, a few other things that I want to cover, and <clears throat> as I usually do, on these channel update videos. Again, I first just want to thank everybody for supporting the channel. Uh, it is very much appreciated. Uh, I keep getting lots of likes and subscribes and quite a few really good comments. I've even had <clears throat> a few developers pop in and leave comments for games that I've covered. I've gotten a couple of uh, Twitter slash X messages from uh, developers and other content creators. And so that's really, really cool to see. And, um, you know, one in particular, oh, heck, I'll just mention it here. Um, and I just, I totally forgot. I should have written the name down. Um, my apologies. But for the developer um, of Bears in Space, I covered that demo, uh, the Steam Next Fest demo for that earlier this week and um it is you know that kind of comical first person shooter platformer game with it's also got some bullet hell stuff in it they are interested in trying to make it a little bit more uh low vision friendly um not quite sure if they'll be able to do total blindness this far into development but there are a few things that they are trying to look into doing and so <clears throat> You know, I posted a kind of a deal about that on X the other day saying, hey, attention, blind and low vision players, um, this developer is open to ideas and feedback. So, you know, watch my video, play the demo for yourself. It is, they have not taken it down on Steam yet. So check it out and uh, yeah, give them some feedback. But huge shout out to them. So that's awesome. Back to the channel, though, um, I do unlock videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. Sometimes, again, more frequently, uh, especially for, like, accessibility events, big gaming industry events, or tech ev events. Um, you know, sometimes, like, these Steam Next Fest demos, I don't know if the demos are going to be taken down. So if I find some that I'm really thinking, you know, I, I, I should cover this, and I think people might enjoy it. Um, <clears throat> that's why I posted a video almost every day last week, uh, because I wanted to make sure that people could uh, try the demos that, uh, for themselves. So yeah, Monday, Wednesday, and Saturdays. Everything is also divided into playlists. So, you know, I, if you are new here, I cover... Uh, games from a legally blind perspective, because I am legally blind, uh, have been all my life. And so, yeah, I, I have playlists for like low vision spotlight game videos, games that I play with my remaining vision, accessible game spotlights, PC, console, and mobile. Um, those are games that, um, that can be played by totally blind uh, or sightless players. Um... VR accessibility, VR games, VR experiences, educational VR. Um, although, again, <clears throat> I've covered VR quite a bit the past few years, but I have not done so lately because uh, I, I'm just not supporting, I'm not buying any new headsets until some of them actually include accessibility in them, and none of them have. Um, except the Apple Vision Pro. And I should, I didn't put that on my list of topics today, but I should touch on that again. So yes, the Apple Vision Pro does have accessibility features built into it, including voiceover. However, unless uh, 
some kind person at Apple or somewhere <clears throat> may offer a review unit for me, I really don't foresee myself spending over $4,000 for the headset and Apple Care and you know, any boost in like storage or accessories, that's a lot of money. Could I afford it? Yes, I actually could. Um, but it's the principle of the thing. And, you know, the Apple headset, the Apple Vision Pro, there's some really cool things about it. And I really, really do want to explore uh, how voiceover and other accessibility features work. I want to get hands on it for myself. But it's still like... You know, at least the meta headsets, even though they're not accessible, you can kind of look at that and go, oh, well, there's games, there's apps, there's exercise things, there's all these different kind of use cases. And I don't doubt that, you know, oh, people are really liking watching movies and shows and things like that and 3D things <clears throat> on the Apple Vision Pro, but it, it still feels sort of gimmicky and there's this kind of tech that's not totally optimal yet and it's a solution looking for a problem a lot of the apps are going to be you know ipad style apps and the thing that i'm that i didn't cover when i when i um did a commentary on um brian tong's video was i don't know like you can zoom into things but you but can you pull them closer um, you know, like, could I take, like, if I had that settings window up in the middle of my living room view, could I pull that window closer to me or is it at that fixed distance, which I've talked many, many times about in virtual reality that I don't like that makes things hard. I did get confirmation, however, though, <clears throat> that as I feared and suspected the Apple vision pro currently does not allow you to use the cameras as a magnification device. So you can't just either open like a magnifier app or even just minimize all the user, you know, all the windows that you have open. And as you're looking at the, you know, as you're looking at your room, could I just like pinch to zoom or something and then, you know, zoom in and use my, use the Vision Pro as a head mounted magnifier, some, like something like the Iris Vision and uh, I have gotten confirmation that no, you in fact can't do that. Another person to watch if you are interested in <clears throat> the Vision Pro, um, go look up The Blind Life on YouTube. Uh, I know him through another project I've been working on for the past few years. He's in a group that I'm in on that. He's a really cool dude. But I don't know if he got a review unit or if he bought one, but he has been covering the Apple Vision Pro as a um, assistive technology low vision user. So he has been playing with voiceover and Zoom and all the other accessibility features as a user, not just as a <clears throat> mainstream press trying to cover accessibility. So... You know, check out the Blind Life. Give him a give him a subscribe. He covers a lot of cool stuff on his channel. Uh, really cool dude. So check him out. Um, I know I keep getting distracted. All these other things keep coming up. But like I said, everything is in playlists. I've got low vision, accessible game videos. I've got hardware reviews, assistive technology videos. Um, please check out my illegal or my growing up illegally cited. Um, playlist. It's a bunch of different topics about, you know, gr well, growing up illegally sighted, legally blind, um, education, employment, some of my early tech memories, gaming memories. Um, how did I get, you know, for people always asking, how did I get into being an assistive technology specialist? How did I get into doing YouTube or technology advocacy and consulting work? Uh, I answer all of those common questions and more in that playlist. Um, <clears throat> another playlist that I have that kind of ties into a, uh, my next topic is I have a playlist of my own videos and other videos where I've been a guest uh, for a podcast, a interview, 
or uh, presentation videos. So, you know, I've presented <coughs> to the Game Accessibility Conference a couple times, Inclusive Design 24, my local independent games chapter, IGDA chapter, and then I've done a lot of different just podcast interviews on anything from game accessibility, VR accessibility, uh, employment, um, and in education and employment stuff. And, you know, building on that, um, if uh, you haven't been following me on Twitter slash X at BGFH79, by the way, um, <coughs> I have shared a few recent um, videos and podcasts I've, I've been on and I'm going to be on. So, um, we have the recent, like I said, recent interviews and stuff. I've been on Vision Forward Tech Connect Live, where we talked about gaming accessibility. I did chat with them about a year, year and a half ago or so on that, but we kind of did a follow-up one a couple of weeks ago, and that was a lot of fun. So check that out. End of last year, I was part of the channel on mobile accessible games, uh, Aaron Spelker's YouTube channel. Check that out. Uh, I was with a couple of people on there, and we just had another discussion on 2023 in game accessibility. I ju we, they just released a couple of videos through XR Access. I've talked about them in the past where, you know, this is an organization that is trying to help make augmented and virtual reality more accessible. And um, as part of their kind of uh, like a spotlight series or kind of their, um, you know, they're trying to you know, share stories, the, the like stories of accessibility, how, you know, both good and bad, positive and negative of virtual and augmented reality and accessibility. Um, and there's some great other speakers. Uh, I was on the, you know, the group that was helping organize those types of things. And then I was also a uh, participant. So I was interviewed for that uh, stories series. And, um, <clears throat> there are some great, what is there, like five or six different people uh, with various diff different diff bleh, different disabilities. And there is a, each person, there is a, like about a three or so minute version, the kind of the Cliff Notes version that is really good. And then if you want to hear their full interview, which, you know, any could be anywhere between like 20 minutes and, you know, a little under an hour or whatever. And, um, so if you want their full interview, you can hear that. And, uh, like I said, but all of them are really, really interesting. But if you want to see my stuff, I did put a link. It is under my playlist for the interviews and podcasts and presentations thing, but you can also get at it through, just look up XR access, all one word, just look up that on YouTube and, uh, you'll see those as some of the latest videos, um, check out and support those stories. So I was, uh, I did that recently and that just came out within the last week or so. And I am going to be on a podcast later this month. I have already recorded it and, uh, we just have to wait for it to become a, or for it to come out. I don't know if I'm fully at liberty to announce it, so I'm not going to exactly say what it is. But again, if you follow me here, you follow me on Twitter um, you'll know, and it is probably a pretty commonly followed podcast if you follow Blindness Technology Podcast, so you might you know, end up seeing it there anyway. Um, but I will let you know when it happens and just probably tell you guys again next month. So there's that. And we recorded this a long time ago, so some of the games we, we you know, we might say that are upcoming or we're not, we're wondering about... We recorded this a long time ago, um, but he's going to be releasing it in the next couple of few weeks. Chad Bowden. Um, we had a really fun discussion, and I would love to chat with him again in the future. So, if, hey, if you're open, let's do it. Um, but we had a good old time talking about just gaming memories and classic old school games and game accessibility and just all kinds of nerdy stuff. And it was a, just a fun, long conversation. So... 
Uh, I'm going to be on his series of podcasts. So you want to check them out. And again, if you follow me, I will retweet and everything when every, when, it, when it's all out and everything. But those are some of... So yeah, I've already been pretty active this year. Um, and uh, been guest hosts and, and interviewed and different things like that on various podcasts and videos. So it's been fun. And who knows you know, what might happen in the future. I don't, I don't have a clue. Um, I, you know, just again, a reminder, the Toby accessibility mod version 7.0 for doom is out. It is like, it has been made a lot easier to set up, download and set up. There is, you know, all the camp, the Toby deluxe one and two campaigns are updated. Operation MDK is updated. The, you know, I have a video on the, I have two videos for 7.0 already. I have the kind of the whole features uh, video where I showcase all the new cool features that are in there. And there's some cool stuff. And then I have just a video on, hey, you know what? If it is intimidating for people to get started with it, he's made it a lot easier. And I literally just, you know, I downloaded the files and I literally showed how to, you know, once they're unzipped, where to move them, uh, what you need to do to get up and running. It's really, if you know how to copy and paste, it's really not that hard. Um, but yeah, Toby Doom 7.0, um, definitely let us know um, if you are planning on doing a video for it or streaming it. I'd love to see it. You know, I would love, he's put so much, shout out to Mr. LMD1. He's put in so much hard work and his team has worked on it so hard and made just really, really cool things that I didn't even know that we would get Doom to be able to do so I really want more people to enjoy it. <clears throat> so just a cheap shout out there, a cheap plug for that. A um, couple of videos on there. And there is a Toby Accessibility Mod playlist. So if you want to kind of look at the history or look at the latest couple of videos there, that's where you'll find them amongst other places. But um, there's that. I've had a couple of other accessible games lately. Um, this um, Downcaster iOS game... I've been, you know, I'm not, I didn't think I was really typically into card battlers, but, you know, uh, this one is uh, voiceover accessible, and it's kind of addictive, I got to admit. So, you know, there's that. A um, couple PC games and iOS games. So, definitely, you know, check out the iOS accessible game spotlight, PC accessible game spotlight video. We had The Last of Us 2 remastered on the PlayStation 5 recently. I'm still working my way through that. I haven't really had much time the last couple of weeks, but I want to get back to that amongst many, <coughs> many other things that I'm falling behind on. And that's kind of, you know, like there's a lot of cool things happening on one hand this year or right around now. But on the other hand, the other theme of this video is kind of exhaustion. <laughs> I was just on vacation like a month, a little over a month ago. And I'm like, I need another vacation. It's just crazy. Um, but uh, let me see if there's any other channel updates before we move on. Um, yeah, I mean, Next Fest demos, I covered those. Yeah, so we're going to go maybe a, get a couple negative topics out of the way here uh, before we talk Microsoft. Um, you know, like I said... The, uh, there's a lot happening. There's a lot of good things happening in game accessibility. We had the Game Accessibility Awards uh, late January. That was a cool thing to see. Um, you know, we're getting... There ha I, I don't know about too many other games, upcoming games yet, that are mainstream games that are going to be accessible, but, you know, I'm sure there will be. But, um, you know, work itself, like my day job has been... January wasn't too bad, but February good lord it has just been non-stop i've been in meetings and meeting with uh, customers like constantly it's just been like keeping up with my calendar and keeping all my people and clients and and things to do keeping all that stuff straight has been kind of crazy and it's it seems like it's still going to be pretty much booked solid at the very least through the end of the month. And then it'll just kind of flow into a new phase um, of busy. So yeah, 
Uh, day job is definitely keeping me quite busy. And, you know, I mean, all this other, like, I'm, I'm really thankful, like, even though, like, yeah, I have all this craziness happening in my day job, <coughs> I'm thankful for things like the YouTube channel, these guest interviews, um, these consulting projects that I get to do on the side, because there's something different, they're fun, I love talking about this stuff, whether it's doing these videos or chatting with other people about it, so it kind of just helps reinvigorate me. Um, to do some of this stuff. So that's cool. But within the last, you know, well, I should say within the first couple of months, you know, we're midway through February, literally midway through February now. And I don't even know what the number is, but like, I think I read even beginning of February, it's like, oh, we're about two thirds or, or better the, the number of layoffs in the tech and game industry uh, that was in 2023. And there were a lot in 2023. We complain about that a lot, as did many other people, justifiably so. But in the first couple of months of this year, 2024, oh yeah, a whole bunch more people got laid off. I mean, I'm not even going to try to name them. I know Microsoft laid off like 1,900 people, and um, I, would, I will officially say yes, my official statement is fucking Embracer Group. Um, yes, that is official, because they are just... <clears throat> they bought up all these like classic franchises and they bought up all these companies and then they just, they're just doing nothing with them. They're laying off and closing studios, canceling projects left and right. And then I saw on Twitter or X this morning, literally they had this post of like, our number one priority is shareholder profit or shareholder, oh, I can't even remember the exact word, but basically it's like, no, the, the number, the, the priority, um, you know, isn't like, yeah, you want to make money, but like, no, we don't care about the, the products or the franchises or the, the businesses that we bought. Um, it's all about the people keeping all of our rich friends happy and keeping uh, all of our executives and shareholders richer. It's all about growth and profit essentially so man all those people that got just or that are getting brutalized by embracer no fuck those guys man they're just no can't stand them these days it, it's just terrible what they're doing to the gaming industry it's horrible i mean it's it's literally it's it's, it's a crime it's criminal what they're doing to the game industry uh So yeah, company, you know, company layoffs, Embracer, you know, I've, I've even heard not just with uh, the layoffs and everything, but, you know, with the whole, the discourse and the election, which I'm not even going to come close to talking about, but it's almost like, you know, the hashtag, uh, hash Brown survive 2024, like, you know, hashtag survive 2024. Like, yes, if we can just survive the chaos, we've got wars, we've got the shootings that just happened. Literally, I just heard about that parade shooting for the Super Bowl parade. I mean, again, what the fuck is wrong with people? We, we've got to do something about all this gun stuff. Um, <clears throat> you know, everyone's uh, posting, oh, our thoughts and prayers. That doesn't do anything. Yeah, you can think and pray all you want, but what is that going to do? Do something. Try something. I know I, 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 we're a broken record here, but clearly saying thoughts and prayers are with people for the last, what, decade now? Um, you know, our, our country is the only stupid enough one to have this much gun violence. Uh, it, it's just got to stop. But, you know, with the layoffs, with the gun violence, with the election, and everyone's at each other's throats, yes, there are some good things happening in 2024, and there's things to look forward to, but damn, son, this is going to be a long year. I have a feeling this is going to be kind of a long year, and I kind of wish I could hibernate until, like, January 20th next year. I, I could just go to sleep, wake me up when it's over, and let me know who's president, and... I'll catch up on things and I don't know, maybe 
do some subliminal, like, and when I'm sleeping, just feed me some information and maybe I'll learn something in my sleep. I don't know. But yeah, this is going to be a crazy year. Um, on a similar line, what I'm really getting tired of, you know, there's this whole thing where in the 90s, early 2000s, you know, you had things filtered through media, you know, your uh, tech and games media, where you would have sites like IGN, GameSpot, you had some more like bigger blogs and things, you had like Joystick back in the day, um, and you had things like that, and, you know, and now it's, you have all these like influencers and independent YouTube channels. I mean, even like people like myself who can, you know, I, I can find my niche. I love action games. I love first person shooters. I love covering games for accessibility. Um, and if some developers want to reach out and I can cover their stuff and give them, you know, give them honest feedback, give people an honest review for their products. That's great. Um, but I think things are getting out of hand with the whole, <clears throat> I don't even know what you would call it, like clickbait headlines, speculation, really spec, not speculation isn't so bad, but speculation as news. Like people are literally taking hearsay. They're taking speculation as fact. And, just, you know, it's like the whole Microsoft thing that we're going to get to shortly. Oh, you know, Microsoft is doomed. Xbox is done. They're, they're pulling a Sega and they're getting out of the console business. And, you know, anyone who owns an Xbox is, you know, it's just going to stop working. You're going to lose access to all your games. And, you know, like the, the sky is falling. The sky is falling. Um, you know, Apple speculation. Like, you know, I could do that too. Hmm. I think that Apple is going to come out with a new iPhone sometime in 2024. Yeah, that's pretty obvious. That's probably going to happen. But I mean, people just like every little thing. Oh man, I think the the new phone is going to have a 32 degree angle on its corner where it was a 34 degree angle last year. I'm like, who cares? Like, is it is it really worth your time to just get that stupid about things? Um, but I really hate these clickbait headlines where... You know, or the, you get these reaction channels, or you get these, you know, I get they're, they're like, you know, they're, they're YouTubers or whatever, but they, their whole shtick is like trying to do predictions and trying to do, um, report a lot of this sensational, um, clickbaity stuff, speculation as actual news, like, Oh, we know the switch, the, the, the sequel to the switch is going to have this, that, and the other thing. No, we don't. We don't know Jack until a Nintendo officially announces things. So, yeah, I might put a very minor speculation here and there when I'm wondering about things. But I like to wait until after an event and go, okay, now we know what Microsoft, at least what they said. We know what Nintendo said in a direct. We know what Sony announced in their recent state of play. Um, we'll know what Apple's going to do at least partially with iOS 18 in June when they inevitably have WWDC. I don't care. I'm not going to follow every rumor and speculation as if it's fact. It's exhausting. Because then everyone's like, oh, I, I post a video and then I find out something different the next day and then I got to post another video and a, or a podcast or a, a tw you know, it's just whatever. I'm just so tired of it. That's it's just it's exhausting. So I just kind of ignore a lot of the you know that's why you don't see me talking a whole lot about like oh here's the recent iPhone rumors or here's what maybe what they're gonna have in iOS 18. Um, hopefully with all this AI stuff maybe they'll make Siri more than brain dead. Um, I don't know but hopefully that'll be the case. But beyond that we'll just wait and see. Um, another topic I wanted to quickly talk, uh, talk a little bit about, and I, again, I've said this multiple times, many times, and I'm sure this won't be the last. Um, I really, really encourage people to support developers, app developers, game developers, hardware developer, whatever it is you want to get, um, whatever it is you need or want or are interested in, if you can try to support them 
with your wallet. Um, there was a, a thread on X earlier Twitter from the developer of, uh, was it 1428 uh, Shadows Over Silesia? Uh, I covered that game on the channel a while back. Um, I thought it was a really cool game. There were there was a part where I really kind of got stuck. It was kind of hard, but it was really cool, and I'm really glad that they made the game blind accessible, blind playable. But he had this sort of bummer thread where he's like, I've gotten so much criticism, and like people are pirating the game. I guess there's some site out there that like, has they're listing pirate apps and pirate software and then so people will download the game and then if something doesn't work or they have a question and then they call for you know they contact the developer for support and they're like oh well oh you pirated the game from here well right so i'm going to support you on a pirated version no and so he kind of i don't remember exactly what he said i um i retweeted it and and stuff but um you know, essentially just, do I really want to continue developing for an audience that doesn't seem that interested, who doesn't, you know, that, that isn't, I don't want to say isn't grateful, but he's putting, you know, again, they're putting so much work into it and not really getting anything in return. Um, and I get where he's coming from, you know? especially if you're a small indie developer, you gotta, you gotta support your family. You gotta pay the bills. You gotta feed your family. You gotta survive. Um, and God knows how expensive everything is for anybody. So, I mean, I don't know if he is going to consider blind accessibility. I know there was somebody else, at least one or two other people and myself who's like, Hey, we bought your game. We appreciate it. We enjoyed it. Um, I, I, I replied to him and I said, please don't, if you, you know, please don't abandon blind accessibility because there are a lot of us who do buy and appreciate it. And that again, that's why we've lost so many audio games. People wonder why the something else games went, went away with, they wonder why many different iOS or PC games have stopped development or have stopped being supported. That's why. People have good intentions in the beginning. They, you know, they're idealistic and they're like, oh, well, we want to make sure that blind people have things to play too. That's great. But then the reality is, oh, if I'm basing my entire livelihood on this, I'm in trouble because not only is it a small market, but then you got people constantly asking for coupon codes or pirating the game, pirating the app or whatever. So... That just really made me sad. It's like, man, just having a developer come out literally and say, yeah, I don't know if I want to do accessibility anymore because the group of people that I'm trying to serve is really kind of making it rough. Um, yeah, that was, that was kind of a sad little... Uh, conversation that I saw. So I really wanted to draw your attention to that. I mean, like I said, not just that game, um, because it is cool, but like I said, just supporting the developers because otherwise, you know, at any time people will just, not only will they stop development, but they'll be like, oh, if I'm going to continue making games, well, now I don't have to worry about accessibility anymore because, you know, people aren't going to support it anyway. So now I don't, it's one less thing I got to worry about. And we want more people to give us games that we can play. Sorry about that. Had to get a drink. Um, so I think we're out of the woods now. I think we're out of the negative stuff. Um, couple upcoming things. We have AxeCon coming up in early March, I believe it is. I'm not sure if my work schedule is going to allow me to attend this year. I'm pretty sure I registered for it already. But with the way my schedule has been filling up lately, who knows? Um, but that's a, you know, an, an accessibility conference. 
Um, the Game Accessibility Conference European Edition is going to be in April. I believe it's like, was it 22nd and 23rd or 21st and 22nd? It's one of the two. 21st, 22nd, 22nd, 23rd. I think it's 22nd, 23rd. Um, if you're in Europe, you can attend it virtually or in person, I should say. If you are uh, want, if you're in America or just want to attend virtually, you can. Um, I will definitely be, attend be attending, even though the European hours make it really interesting uh, time-wise here for my time zone. But I, it's you know whether it's the European or the North American version, uh, the Game Accessibility Conference is one of my a couple of my favorite times a year. Love to hear what um, developers are doing. Love to hear from other, you know, players, advocates, companies, developers. It's just a really, really fun time to learn and network. So keep those in mind. I already talked about... I already talked about um, Bears in Space, uh, the demo. Uh, try the demo out, watch my video, maybe give the developers feedback so they can improve accessibility. Um, one other piece of news, I guess it was, I put it in a different part of my list. Um, I just read something a lot of different places the other day that, um, Sony is because of, I guess they didn't make as many sales of their PlayStation five as they want to do. It sounds like they're not going to be support. I mean, they're going to support the PlayStation five for a while yet, but they're kind of in their wind down phase. So, so to speak, you know, you, you know, the first start of the generation, you're ramping up and developers are learning the console and, <clears throat> and then, then it kind of hits its stride and you're getting all these amazing games. And then, you know, you're kind of winding down towards your next system. Personally, I'm really, I, I really don't like that news because well, they came out in what, 2020? Yeah, okay, it's already four years in. But it doesn't seem like it. You know, we had the whole pandemic, of course. And we had the whole shortage. You couldn't really find systems, whether Xbox or PlayStation, for a while. But, I mean, you know, there was a lot of... There was, during, you know, game development, there was a lot of um, cross-platform or cross-generation games in development, really, until, pff, what, 2022? Maybe even a little bit of 2023, and we've had some major games, you know, but we've had a lot of updates. We've had a lot of like, you know, the last of us got remastered. There's been other remasters or cross, again, cross generation games. Um, but when you really think about it, I, I, it feels at least to me, like there really haven't been all that many like Xbox Series, PlayStation 5 generation exclusives or, you know, games that are that are only on that platform. You know, like a lot of the other stuff came to the PS4 or Xbox One. Um, and I, like, I'm happy with the fidelity. Like, I, I know a lot of people maybe care about it, but... I don't care about 4K. Um, I would much rather play something in 1080p if it meant I got a steady frame rate. I would rather devs focus on, you know, graphics are great right now. Let's just keep them for where they are for a while. Work on our artistic style instead of bumping up the, the you know, the graphics fidelity all the time. There's a lot you can do with an art style. But beyond that, I would love to see, I would love to see just when you buy a game at launch that the games work, um, that we don't need dozens of patches. We don't need 50, 100 gig day one patches for a game. Um, you know, if you, because there's this whole argument between physical and digital games. Well, on one hand, you know, you want to say, well, I want to buy physical because what if they take it off the service and then you then you don't have access to it anymore? Fair point. But then on the on the physical side, well, if I buy a disc 
of the game, it's more than likely broken or outdated anyway. And even if it was, maybe I want to play that game 10 years from now. Who knows? You know, again, it still ties into digital because they still will have to have the platform service alive so that you can download the whatever the number of patches you're going to need to make the game playable or less buggy into a fairly finished state. So I think that I really would love to see, you know, and, and this, and again, this feeds into the, all the layoffs. It feeds into the constant greed and endless monetization. You know, everything has to be about growth. Um, yeah, of course you want to grow a little bit. You know, you, you would love to see numbers increase or whatever, but like if you're making a gazillion dollars a year anyway, like I would be happy with that. That's like saying, well, I'm not happy in my job because I'm only making $30 million, million a year. I need to make $70 million. And then next year I got to make $130 million. And I'm like, <sighs> everything has just gotten so monetization focused. Especially in, you know, AAA or now as Ubisoft is saying, quadruple A. Give me a break. Give me a break. Um, I mean, I, like, and that's why I'm really playing so many more indie titles again, because I just, I love, I love that, you know, you're getting some really damn good looking indie games, you know? I mean, you can make indie games that kind of feel and look like triple A games did even like a generation ago. Yeah. If you want to go for the eight or 16 bit you know, retro gaming style look or the early 90s first person shooter look. Sure, you can do that, but you don't have to. You know, I've seen some mighty fine looking indie games. Um, and usually they come out in a much more finished state. They might have patches, um, but generally, you know, they just feel a little better. They're not as focused on monetization and endlessly bending the consumer over for every bit of profit they can wring out of you. Um, there's more creative because again, you get these again, triple a games that are, they cost so much money to make that they have to play it safe. They can't take as many risks. So you kind of get the same thing over and over and over again. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm very curious to see what's going to happen with the triple a big budget games like there to me there seems like there's going to have to be some sort of like a crash or some sort of a like real big mm, I, I don't even know what word I'm looking for there's going to be some big change or there should be some big change happening it might be forced but it seems like something's got to happen here eventually um because yeah I mean like I want to focus on fun. Like I play games to have fun, to relax, to enjoy the story, not to, you know, worry about if it's going to run, if it's going to run smoothly, is it going to crash? Um, how many different currencies do I have to support to play the damn game? All this stuff that has gotten so commonplace that, again, exhausting. When I'm done for the day, I want to turn on my computer or sit down in front of my computer, sit down in front of my system and just jump into a game and play and have fun. You know, bring back cheat codes, bring back, um, I don't know. Like those are, the, I, I would just love the industry to, you know, back down. A lot of us are really happy. You know, you can still have, you know, pretty high production values, but you don't have to, you know, I mean, a, a game like Robocop Rogue City, yeah, it had a few shortcomings here and there, but the developers were clearly fans of the material, and um, it showed, like, they, they've added New Game Plus to it, and when I finally get some time, I would love, love, love to go back into that game again. Um, cause it just felt great playing as RoboCop. 
And, you know, maybe people would call it a B-tier game. But you know what? That's fine. I'm perfectly fine with that. Give me a give me a creative art style. Give me a neat gameplay hook. Um, I don't know. I know I've gotten a little bit off topic or a little bit of rant, but it all, like I said, it all kind of fuels together. You know, if people just kind of back down a little bit, slow down, um, you know, and people chasing the trends, you know, because again, these games take so long to make. And so now everyone is chasing the first, it was military shooters and then it was battle Royale. And now it's, um, live service games. And so, you know, if it takes two, three years, four years to develop a game, you know, people only have so much time, whether, you know, and if you're going to, everyone's trying to do a live service, with a subscription or season passes or endless monetization, there's already well-established things out there. You might get another one that'll break through and be the new fad, the new thing, but it's going to be a lot harder. And that's where you get your company layoffs and things because they're betting on these things, these trends, these fads, instead of just like, Hey, we want to like, I'm a game company we have a great idea for a game and we want to make this. We want to make a great single player game or we want to make a multiplayer game, but that, that has this hook to it. Um, you know, cause by the time it's like, Oh, the battle Royale thing is kind of maybe phased out a little bit. So now people launch and then how many battle Royales failed? There was, what was it called? There was that melee one that I covered on the channel shortly before it, um, before it went under last, was it last year or the year before? Um, it was a really fun, that one I actually really had a lot of fun with, but uh, it it, um, it got shut down, as did many, many other ones. And now we're going to get to all these live service games that implode because there's not enough people to, there's not enough hours in the day for people to play all of them. So I digress. There's problems that need to be addressed. But on the other hand, we are getting some amazing indie games, even a few AAA games that are really awesome. Accessibility is better than it's ever been, and it's improving, so there's things to look forward to. Um, But I do want to talk a little bit about Xbox, and I will say hopefully a little bit, because um, really, they really didn't say much. Um... You know, again, I said earlier, people blow things way out of proportion. They take these sensationalist speculation and pass it off as news. And then it's just, you know, it's like the telephone game where the people just spread the fire and um, that's what people think, you know. And so Microsoft had about a 22 minute event um, today and it wasn't a showcase. They didn't show any games, but it was just like, hey, we need to. Um, put out a fire here, put out some fires, explain what's going on, explain a few of our business decisions going forward. And basically what they said was that, yes, we are exploring for uh, four different games. They didn't even announce the titles, um, but they said within the fairly near future, we're going to have four games that we are going to bring to other platforms that are not Xbox. They didn't even say Nintendo or PlayStation, um, but one might expect either one or both. But what they did say is there were two titles that were more live service-esque games, and there were two titles that were maybe smaller indie games that maybe didn't perform as well as they did. They've been, they've been all of these games, all four of them have been out for a while on a Microsoft platform on Xbox or PC. And, um, you know, but like two were live service, two are maybe games that they want, they they think are really good, but they just deserve more attention. Uh, the developers deserve you know, more sales and maybe, you know, they're, they're done getting a lot of their sales on Xbox. So yeah, let's, um, it makes sense to bring that to other platforms. And, you know, people have speculated, um, hi-fi rush. I could totally see, especially with the cool, like art style and just the, the whole style of the game in general, 
I could see that fitting very well on Switch if it would run um, that, you know, or even on PlayStation. But I could see that being a very good Switch title. Pentiment was another one that people were talking about. You know, kind of a, you know, a really cool little indie game, which, by the way, is accessible. I did cover that on the channel when it came out. Was it last year? Um, kind of a adventure style game. Um, so Pentiment might come out on, and like I said, that could be one of them. People are very much speculating, um, Sea of Thieves. And that, that actually makes a lot of sense to me because that game has been out since the Xbox one days. Um, it's been out for what, six years now or so. And so you think that would run on, uh, even the switch pretty well. You know, it's got a really cool kind of, uh, that kind of cartoony art style that would work really well on a Nintendo platform. It may work really well on Sony. And again, they're, they're trying to look at the main thing that Xbox kept saying today was they want to meet people where they are. You know, they want to play on PC console, the cloud, sometimes even, um, non Xbox devices when that makes sense. You know, and if you already have the player base as big as you're going to get on PC and Xbox, you know, sure, maybe even, you know, maybe you could make it free to play or you could sell it for cheaper on um, on Switch or PlayStation. Like, Sea of Thieves would make actually a lot of sense um, for being more family friendly and it's already well established. There's loads of content for it. So, yeah, that, that one would would make a lot of sense to me. But, um, you know, we don't know what the titles are, um, but they said, you know, they didn't want to spoil, like, when the companies themselves are ready to unveil them, they will. Um, but what they did say is because the Activision Blizzard merger, what was it, March 28th, Diablo 4 will be coming to Game Pass, so any of you folk who have not bought Diablo 4 but own a PC or an Xbox you will be able to try Diablo 4, and its blind accessibility is pretty dang good. I do hope that they add a little bit more in the way of, like, um, navigation assist to navigate the world, because that is the major shortcoming of the game right now. But everything else, like, I know a lot of blind players who are playing it. Uh, a, lot, a lot of low vision players are playing it. I want to get back to it. You know, the menus are all text-to-speech narrated. Um... There are environment sound effects for, like, collectibles or bushes you can smash through. Um, it's voice acted. So there is a lot there already. Um, but now you'll be able to try it for yourself in March. Game Pass. So they did talk about that. The other thing that they did say, they did, again, it was, it, on one hand, it answered some questions. Because people were all, like I said, the sky is falling, Xbox is ending, they're going to quit making consoles, they're not going to support the Xbox hardware anymore. That doesn't seem to be the case at all. They're taking these four titles, they may do some titles in the future, and from from what I inferred the way that they talked about things, it's going to be maybe, you know, you, you release things on Xbox and PC, you release it on Game Pass or whatever, it makes all the sales that it can... And then, yeah, if it makes sense, um, you know, maybe it's a multiplayer title and, you know, there's not enough people playing it anymore, but people want to keep playing it. Um, yeah, put it on on PlayStation 5. Put it on the next Switch. Um, maybe it's a, you know, again, maybe it's a single player game, an indie title or something. Maybe a B tier, you know, like a, a, like a B level game or a, like an indie title that just didn't get the attention that it, it deserved. Yeah, throw you know, let it be out for six months or a year. Throw it on another platform. Um, it'll still be available on Xbox. It might still be available on Game Pass. Um, but to me, that doesn't hurt the Xbox brand at all. Um, I'm fine with that. I've been even reading um, official things from Sony saying that they're looking at bringing. You know, they've already started with like The Last of Us Part One and. God of War and the Spider-Man games. So, uh, Horizon series, uh, you know, they're starting to bring things more to PC too. So, 
you know, the, the big exclusives, they're still going to be there, but it's going to be far less important than it has been in the past. Um, so yeah, like they didn't commit to anything in the future. They're like, we're just doing these four. We're not going to rule out future games coming to other platforms, but we are still going to focus on Xbox, Game Pass, Play Anywhere, cross-play, cross-buy, cross-save. Um, in, and they did confirm, at least for the foreseeable future, no Indiana Jones and Starfield are not going multi-platform. They will remain, at least for now, Xbox PC exclusive. So that is not happening because that was also speculated. So again, that is why I wait until after these things. Because then people go back and forth and it just gets nuts. So we're having those. Um, again, they, like they answered questions. They said Xbox hardware is not going away. Exclusives are not going away. Game, We're still supporting Game Pass. And they, but they didn't say any specifics, but they did, uh, Phil said there may be a hardware announcement later this year. And again, I'm not really going to dive deep and speculate on what it could be, but you know, all that much. Yeah. And maybe it's a refresh of the Xbox, a, 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 a series X with a, without an optical drive. Maybe it's a portable. Who knows? Um, that's all I'm going to say. Who knows? I'm just going to wait for them to announce what it is. Um, but they said they're doing some kind of a hardware around the holiday season this year. And then they said where they're working on the next generation already. And I mean, again, you take this with a grain of salt because again, it's marketing, it's business speak. So they kind of have to talk this way. But they're like, our next generation, we are planning on, this is going to be the biggest hardware jump you have ever seen. That's literally like what he said. Will it be? I don't know. But again, like I said, I'm just, I'm not ready for this generation to end. I literally just had my PC built last year. There haven't even been all that many current generation um, games. A lot of it is, has been cross-generation. I would be perfectly happy going with the PS5, going with the Xbox series for another five years. I'd be okay with that. Um, I just, I don't want to, I don't want to invest and pay for all new consoles and all that crap again. But, um, I mean, that's really what they said. Four titles. We get Diablo 4 in March. Um, they'll announce what the titles are at a later date. They are not getting out of the hardware business. They are still supporting Game Pass. They are still supporting their, uh, uh, exclusive from like Bethesda and Activision and, you know, whoever else. Um, you know, of course your Call of Duty, your Minecraft, your, all those different things will still continue to go multi-platform. So that's not changing. I mean, literally, other than the four titles in Diablo on Game Pass, it kind of seems like business as usual. I mean, that, that's what it seems. And on one hand, you know, I think in a way Microsoft doesn't get enough credit because there are things they do really well. Um, they were the first system to really do accessibility really well on their, on their game console. The dashboard on their Xbox One and series are very accessible to blind players. I really like their play anywhere and their cross buy cross save. So if you, if you're on and, and game pass, so if I get something on the PC and decide to play it on my Xbox series S, not only can I just do that, I can download the game on both play them interchangeably, but the cross saves, they just, you don't even have to think about it. You just, you know, I can play it on the Xbox pick it up on my PC later and I can continue right where I left off. I remember when I had that HP PC uh, a couple of years ago, I was trying to play um, Halo Infinite and I kept having a PC crash because I'd get to this one part of a level and every time, literally every time I got to this ramp, the game would just crash. I'm like, I don't know what's causing it. I don't know. Then I thought, wait a minute. I could also play this on the cloud. So I literally went to the Xbox app on my computer, 
And instead of playing the game locally, I streamed it so that it was being played on whatever server and it was just feeding me the audio and the video. And I was able to play that level, get to that part with the ramp, and I kept going. I finished that little mission that I was on. I beat a boss. I got back out to the overworld. And then I stopped uh, that stream, waited a minute or two, fired up my local game that I had installed, and the save got downloaded again, and I was past that weird crash point. So if I was just relying on, um, you know, my local install until the until the game got patched or something or until I figured it out, I was stuck. Like, I literally, it crashed every time. Um, but that is just a unique case. But, you know, like I said, maybe you're visiting family. You can play on your phone. You could play... Um, you could take your Series S with you and then come back and play it on your PC. Like, there's just so much flexibility with it. And so it's really smooth. And then you look at the... Play, you, like, the PlayStation, the way it does, like, PS4 and PS5 stuff, it's really jank. Like, sometimes you don't even realize... It's hard to tell if you're downloading the PS4 or PS5 version of a game... Sometimes if you have a PS4 save, you have to download the old PS4 game and then try to get it to the cloud and then download the PS5 version and hopefully it'll import. It's a freaking mess. Um, so that needs to be cleaned up. So Microsoft's doing a lot of good in there. But like I said, really nothing much has changed. But the main thing that has to change, the one thing that I would say has to improve is... They bought so many of these damn developers in the last five, six years. They got to come out with more games and they got to come out with better games. First party titles. Redfall was a dud. Starfield was a partial dud. Um, these were big, especially Starfield was a very anticipated game. People love Bethesda RPGs. I love Bethesda RPGs. And it just didn't click with me. I mean, some people it kind of did, but it was not the success they were hoping. And I think that's part of why they're opening up more. Is they're like, well, let's see if we can get some of this stuff, you know, better. But like I said, we've got Fable and Perfect Dark and Avowed and so many other things coming. But like I said, with all these companies they bought... They better, you know, they got to start producing some, they got to start finishing some quality games. They got to finish some quality games and hopefully not have more duds because that sucks. It sucks for Microsoft and it sucks for us. So that is the Microsoft event. That is kind of what is going on right now. It is insanely busy. There's a lot of things that are exhausting and annoying. But there's a lot to look forward to as well. So that is where we will wrap it up here. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Give it a like if you did. Follow me on Twitter slash X at BGFH79. Um... You can uh, follow me on Twitter at BGFH79, twitch.tv slash illegally cited, illegally cited.com, and right here on YouTube. Until next time, I will chat with everybody again later.